So welcome to our panel uh, on DRM, DRM3 to be specific. The long and windy road to DRM3 eBooks and libraries is actually the name of a, an article that I wrote about a couple of months ago on No Shelf Required, which inspired this panel. And a little bit about me, I and about No Shelf Required. I run No Shelf Required. It's a, maybe some of you know it. It's a portal on eBooks and digital content for libraries and publishers and all who work with eBooks and digital content. We uh, are 10 years old this year. Uh, we publish everything from press releases to, to opinion pieces and, and scholarly articles. And DRM Free has been our focus the last year. We also um, extensively publish and have a relationship with ALA. Our new book, No Shelf Required 3, which you can see on the screen, is um, going to be released in early 2019. And, and it's a mix, it's a compilation of articles on various issues related to ebooks, including DRM, written by librarians and, and publishers and all kinds of innovators who do all kinds of different things with ebooks. So much for. Um, self-promotion. We're going to move on to the panel now. Um, so DRM free. Um, well, I think we think that there are three different ways we can talk about it today from three different perspectives. Uh, from the perspective of a publisher, big and sm small and big, perspective of a vendor, the middleman, the, the, the entity that works in the middle that, that acts as a bridge between the publishing industry and the library community. And then the librarians, of course, the library perspective. So I'd like to introduce our panel um, today um, and our panelists, starting with um, Ben Ashcroft, uh, VP of Sales and Marketing for DeGroyter, uh, Dean Smith, Director at Cornell University Press, the two vendor representatives we have on the panel, uh, Kari Paulson uh, with ProQuest, and Kara Cruz Cruzley. Cruzley, I'm sorry, with EBSCO. Uh, and then we have two librarians on the panel, Allison Bradley, who's with Davidson College, and Angela Dresselhaus, who's with Eastern Carolina University. So in a couple of minutes, uh, each one of these panelists will uh, speak to you about what DRM and DRM-free means to them and to their business. So I have a couple of slides here, just to keep it really simple. Um, one of them is what I hope we don't spend a lot of time talking about, and that's the things that we already know, because we, we meet a lot at these conferences, a lot, and we talk a lot about issues, and I think some of them we've pretty much, um, we, we agree on. So I'd like us to focus on the things that we don't know or that we need to experiment with to better understand the possibilities with DRM-free content. So here's what I think we know. Um, we know that the vast majority of ebooks are still encrypted with DRM. We know that academic publishers do not oppose DRM. We know that because many of them, most of them, actually offer their content DRM free on their own platforms. We know that everybody wants to sustain what they do. For publishers, they want to sustain their businesses. Librarians want to meet the needs of their users. We also know that some publishers have more control in the market than others for various reasons. We can get into that later. We know that money is too tight to mention all over. Uh, and you know, we know discoverability. We know that everybody benefits from it. Authors, publishers, users, the academic community. Uh, the more content is out there, the more, um, the more people it reaches and it inspires. And we all feel like we're doing a better job. Um, and here's something that I've added that might be a little controversial. And feel free to ask about this later in our Q&A session. Um, in my own research shows that the more protection we layer on top of content and ebooks, the more we're actually moving people away from libraries and encouraging piracy, uh, the 800 pound gorilla in the room. And then I also think that the wait and see approach of all of us, publishers and librarians alike, uh, is preventing us from exploring better opportunities and, and possibly some new horizons. So here's what I'd like us to focus on today, and here's what our panelists are here to talk to you about. So how does DRM Free work with complex ebook business models? Uh, we know that it works for the not so complex ones. What about the models like short-term loans? 
can and should DRM free work across content types? It's not the same when we talk about DRM free in the context of a textbook versus a context in the context of a reference book. Um, Combining DRM free and DRM protected on the same platform, what does that do to the user experience? Uh, how much is it, is it harming their, their experience with the content and the book? And then the big one, and I'd like all of the panelists to you know, share their perspectives on this. What factors influence their decision making? And by, by decision making, we mean, I mean everything from how does a publisher decide what E what what ebook to, to what content type makes a better DRM free ebook? How do librarians decide um, how to handle all of this on their library platforms? And in that spirit, I've um, I've created this little slide that explains the. I hope that the Q and A well the, the questions that I'd like to ask each one of the panelists is. Um, for, for publishers, for the two panelists who represent the publishing community to talk to us about obviously their decision-making process, as I said, and also like the categorization of books and, and, and especially in the context of course materials and course adoption, which has been the topic of the conference all along. For the vendors, I'd like them to, since they're the ones who really get to see, they're the, they're, they synthesize this content, that they work with both sides, they, 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 they have a very specific perspective on what's going on, they can shed light on what they see are actual emerging patterns uh, and what they consider to be the new possibilities for everybody. And then the librarians, um, obviously, the ones that work with the users, because the, um, everything we do is only as good as, 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 as it serves the needs of, of the researchers. So we'd like the librarians to focus on what it's like for them in the context of just the general user experience and the more specific um, kind like DRM free in the context of serving the needs of, of researchers with disabilities, et cetera. And then pricing. Uh, how should all this be priced? How can we come up with, how can we continue working on developing business models that are able to find that, give us that win-win situation where librarians are getting the most, the most bang for their buck while the publishers are able to protect their bottom lines. So without further ado, I'd like to bring the panelists back on um, in the spotlight. And I'd like to start by introducing Mr. Ben Ashcroft. And I'd like if he can come up and um, speak to us about. Uh, slides up. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Good. Hi, I'm I'm Ben Ashcroft. I'm uh, VP of Marketing and Sales at Gibraltar. Um, how do I move this forward? Oh wait. Okay. Sorry, I'm not seeing the same thing on the screen as as, as you're seeing on the big screen, so it's slightly confusing. So. Um, when I say I'm from De Gruyter, occasionally we, the response is de who. Um, so I wanted just to spend a couple of, uh, a couple of minutes explaining, explaining who we are because it has a relevance. Um, understanding what, who De Gruyter is and the content that we have has a relevance to how we take decisions about DRM. We're a, um, a German-based international academic publisher um, concentrating on high-level uh, research content for the most part. Um, with a very, very broad base of subjects across, across 28 different subject areas. Um, as you can see on the slide, I put a few numbers up there. We're talking about a huge amount of content, over 50,000 ebooks online at the moment, um, another um, 1,500 to 1,700 open access uh, books on the platform as well. Um, and we've been doing ebooks pretty much since, uh, since ebooks became an issue at all back in 2008 was the first time that we published them. Um, the other thing that we're known for is that we provide um, the digital distribution for a range of, uh, of American university presses and other publishers who we partner with, um, whose content is available on our platform. Um, and we, uh, yeah, we provide the, the digital distribution and, uh, and, um, and access to uh, libraries for, uh, for their content on our, on our library platform. 
So there's a huge amount of content there, um, making that navigable, making it discoverable, um, making it understandable to people, um, especially across multiple languages, multiple formats, um, is a big issue. Um, and that really very much informs our approach to, uh, to DRM uh, and how we manage access to that content. So we try and make it as simple as possible. Um, DRM at De Gruyter, you could say, basically, it doesn't exist. Um, all of the ebook content on degreuter.com is DRM free for institutional customers. Um, and we do that, as I said, just to, just to make it as easy as possible for all concerned. It's, no, it's in no one's interest, uh, neither ours nor librarians nor users, for us to be putting barriers up to people finding the content and using it. We don't want using ebooks to be any more complicated than using a print book. You know, if, you, if you're looking through a print book or selecting print books from the stacks in a library, you're never going to come up, come up against a message that says, you know, maximum number of uses reached or whatever on a print book. Why should that be the case for an ebook? So we've tried very hard right from the beginning to try and take some of the complexity out of our offering to be consistent across it and say, okay, DRM free within a library environment is the way that we go for everything that we do. That said, we as a publisher and as a copyright owner, we do have the, the, the right and the responsibility as well to manage uh, access to our content in different environments. In a, in a library environment, it, it's fairly simple. It's a safe environment to play in. Um, it's governed by licensing conditions. We, we, are, we are lucky to have librarians who um, have a strong sense of responsibility towards, uh, towards copyright and towards um, managing the access to content. Outside of the library world, we do apply DRM for the consumer market um, simply to protect our, in, our, our interests and the interests of our authors um, because we don't have the same trusting relationship with all the people who may, for example, download a, a Kindle book from, from, from Amazon. Um, Recently, we have decided to extend the DRM free um, to our major aggregator uh, partners, ProPress and EBSCO, also in the interest simply of improving the experience of, of readers and researchers, regardless of what platform they're, um, they're accessing the content on. Um, if, if a choice has been made to use our, our content on a platform other than ourselves, um, I don't really see any good reason why uh, we should put barriers in the path of the people who, who want to do that. So all good and all simple, right? Well, kind of, yeah. But, but even for us, with, with our, our pretty simplistic and liberal approach to DRM, there are, there are issues. Um, there are content types. De Groot is not a significant textbook publisher, but we do have a textbook list. Um, and textbooks are, are, are one of the content types which does uh, give us pause for thought when it comes to thinking about uh, issues around DRM. But those issues aren't really strictly DRM issues, but they, are, they do have to do with how DRM and access um, impact on our, on our commercial interests in the end. Um, and those are issues that many other publishers face in, in a significantly uh, greater way if, if, if their revenue is, is more dependent than ours is on, on, on textbook adoption sales. That said, the transparency in terms of how to differentiate between those content types is, is, is very difficult. And we, and we have problems with that as well. How do you define an adoptable book? How do you define a textbook? Um, how do you make that understandable, well, internally for a start? Uh, within a publishing house, but, but it gets even harder if you're trying to explain it to a diverse range of, of customers and users in, a diverse, in diverse markets to whom that, uh, that content might mean very different things depending on where, who they are and, where, and, and how they work. For the vast majority of the high-level uh, research content uh, that we publish, it's a, it, it's, a, it's a pretty simple exercise. It gets more complicated when, uh, when, when we start looking at different contexts content types. Those commercial issues that are referred to are one reason why many publishers and, and de Groot is not immune from this either um, find themselves making decisions about, about access um, and DRM in a way that harks back to the print world. 
And we're fully aware that that is a, a non sequitur. We're fully aware that it makes not that much sense <clears throat> to be defining your ebook models on the basis of 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 a, of, a, of, a, of use in a different in a different medium. But the the harsh reality of the situation for many publishers is that the revenue stream from for example, adoptable print textbooks is still significant. And the need to deal with that in such a way that you don't cut off a valuable re revenue stream is something that then does end up driving, driving decision making. Um, we tackle that um, not by imposing DRM on textbooks, but by um, applying a multiplier uh, to the price. So we publish all our textbooks as ebooks. Um, but um, in order to uh, compensate uh, for the revenue that uh, we are likely to lose, um, and do in some cases lose because uh, sales of, of the printed uh, books to students uh, go down, um, we will charge a, a multiplier of the, of, of the price for unlimited access within a library environment. We're not comfortable with, with, with um, those print models driving our approach to, to pricing and DRM in the e-world, but uh, it's, it's a reality that we, have to, that we have to deal with, and as yet, we haven't found a better approach. Um, I'm going to skip the point about piracy and come back to that maybe in the, Q, in, in the Q&A. Just, just, just to talk briefly about um, interlibrary loan and sharing. Um, if you pursue the, the, the point of view that really using e-books should be as close to using uh, print books as possible, which, which, which I do believe it should be, um, then it should also be possible to, to lend e-books. Um, and in principle, we have nothing against the idea of, 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 of lending e-books. And I don't think there's any strict copyright or legal reason why we would want to try and uh, why we would want to prevent it. What's missing is, is a technical technological solution, to be honest, um, to get around the issue that an ebook can't actually be lent. If you send an ebook to somebody, they download it, they have it, they have it permanently. So you have you have an additional copy out there um, with somebody who is not the who is not the customer to whom you license that book in the first place. Um, there are technological, there are attempts out there to develop technological uh, solutions to that. Occam's Reader is one. There's another um, system being developed in, in, in Germany uh, and piloted uh, for, uh, for interlibrary loans within a consortium. Um, those things are promising, um, but they need to become much more widespread before uh, we would feel comfortable including, including uh, uh, sharing and an ILL as part of our standard uh, ebook uh, ebook conditions. Okay, that's DRM from one publisher's point of view. Um, okay. okay. Thank you, Ben. So, Dean, you can go next. Do you need help? Thank you, Mirjola, and thanks for having me uh, for the invite, Kara. <clears throat> it's great to be in Charleston because in the South I get recognized as the basketball coach from North Carolina. So I'm very happy about that. Um, I've been at Cornell University Press for three and a half years, and it's been a fantastic uh, place to be to experiment and to innovate. Next year will be our 150th anniversary. Uh, we were founded in 1869 four years after the university by a person named Andrew Dixon White, who saw the need for a press as an intellectual organ to support publishing in the university. He gave us a steam cylinder press and some typeface. And from that point on, it was a place where people could come and earn a living as students. Uh, journeyman printers would come through Ithaca and work at the press. And we're getting reacquainted with this really amazing history as we go through this process. Um, also, the university was founded on any person, any course of study. So right from the beginning, there was a diversity element and component to Cornell. And we try to mirror that in the things that we do. Um, 
we publish uh, about 150 titles a year, and next year we'll have uh, 150 open access titles. Let's see. All right, so I arrived in Cornell in 2015. We had about 178 eBooks. Uh, in 2019, we'll have 3,100. So we've expanded, digitized more titles, um, basically along the lines of discovery, access, and global dissemination. I, I believe that that's very important, um, that Cornell has a land-grant mission, and we want to serve that. Um, making content accessible, my boss, the director of the libraries, Gerald Beasley, he is very much concerned about having some kind of access option for this content. Um, we, and, and that, that we look at. So, and I will also say at the beginning, we've managed to double our ebook revenues since 2015. So this is the only line of revenue growth that we see is ebook revenue. So print units are declining, the model is broken. Um, you know, we're selling less monographs everywhere we go. And I'm working with my colleagues in the library and talking about their uh, negotiations with the STM journaling publishers. And what I see there is even a 2% increase on a base of $5 million is about $100,000. And if that's coming out of the book budget, that's for on a, at an average price of about $40, that's 2,500 books less that will be purchased by libraries. So I'm very much concerned about that. I'm looking for sustainability. I don't have to drive a profit. I have to get to zero. Every year is a journey to get my budget to zero. There are a lot of names we participate in, a lot of these programs, MUPO, you know, multiple user, single user. Um, my staff, I don't think, understands any of what that means. It's all, is it unlimited use? Is it DRM free? And we are, now we've just uh, decided to experiment with DRM free to see. Um, I will be 100% honest, I, when I discovered we had 700 books on the LiveGen site, the, the Sci-Hub site, I lost sleep for about three months and then I thought, Man, it'd be great to get some usage stats. I'd really love to know. I'm an open access publisher already through that, but I'd love to find out what's actually happening. Is there a business model there that that will uh, support? And, and, and I mentioned, you know, universities in, by and large have kind of lost their way is the way I, from, from my point of view in, in terms of, you know, they're basically communications people drive universities. Full paying tuition is really on the top of people's mind people's minds, football teams, university presses are not anywhere on the landscape, not even thinking about it. There's no even any knowledge of the fact that we even do peer review, which is, uh, you know, we, uh, I get people who think we are publishing business cards and things like that because it says press. So my job is to educate and to, you know, we're about halfway down the hill in a, a, a sort of mezzanine, scholarly mezzanine on the hillside there where we do this and we credential, you know, we. We probably, we've published 6,000 titles since 1869. A thousand, hundreds, hundreds of those are tenure books that, that we've provided, you know, helped people get their careers. We have two editors that have over 45 years of experience each. And they have shaped disciplines. They've shaped international affairs and workplace studies. And they are the go-to editors. I don't want them going anywhere, actually. But through, through e-books, what I can do is if I'm in five aggregations, I can say to my stakeholders, those books are available in 80 countries through Project Muse, through JSTOR, through DeGroyter, through Oxford, um, that, that, through EBSCO, through eBrary. That, that's where people are accessing our content. It's not must-have content, right? We know that, but it must be discoverable. Um, so we've started something, Cornell Open. That's our NEH grant program, and we'll have 150 of those books up next year. DRM-free, to me, does not mean free to the world. Uh, there's still things that are governed by the license that bad actors will be bad actors, right? I mean, that's, we have known, you know, the 800 pound gorilla. Um, and I like the idea of trying to make it simple for libraries and scholars and to innovate. And I come from this as a publisher, as a professor. I'm, my text that I assigned to my students at GW um, was this year available for, for the first time as an ebook. And so I sent the link to the students. I used it myself. The user experience was awful. Terrible. So I'm sure all of them bought the text in print because it was not easy to use to scroll down that PDF, to do, you know, how are you, the browsability wasn't there. At least I couldn't use it. I went back to carrying around the text 
now for the, and, and that's what I will continue to do. So, and as an author myself, I would love my book to be as access, accessible everywhere. You know, that's something that I want to make happen. And we do believe that we publish books that matter. So if you didn't have university presses, you wouldn't get a lot of the stories that we are interested in. What we're trafficking in is ideas. And you know, this book on the other side here, Wounds of War, that talks about why it's not a good idea to privatize veterans' health care. Or Deadly River, where you have uh, the UN's cover-up of, of the cholera academic, uh, epidemic in Haiti, violence as a generative force, about a, a never-before-known genocide that occurred in Croatia in 1941, and Linus Pauling's The Nature of the Chemical Bond. So you see tradition, excellence, content that matters from university presses. And so we want that. I want that content as far and as distributed as far as, and as widely as possible. Cornell has a global mission, and that's something we also uh, pay attention to. So I'm, I'm looking at this from an experimental and an innovation standpoint. And I will continue to do that to, until I see it actually hurt what's going on. So thank you. Thank you, Dean. So you've heard the perspectives of two different publishers from the standpoint of a university press, a larger publisher, an author, um, a nonprofit. And thank you, Dean, for reminding us that editorial matters and quality matters. I, my own background is in editorial, so I, I, I still get annoyed when I see academic content that doesn't look like it was properly edited and copy edited. And, and so publishers do help us uh, it's important to separate the business of writing, the act of writing something and researching, and then actual, the actual business of publishing it and putting it out there. And that's a real investment. So, and also, for um, the one thing that I'm seeing in, in my own work with different companies is that, and this is the same on the academic side as on the trade side, smaller publishers have specific needs. And, and, it's, and I see this trend more and more. They're putting their content out there because they don't have they cannot afford not to, so they work with everybody, and that matters to them. They, want their, they don't have their own platforms that house their own content, so they rely on distributors and aggregators to help put it out, because it, it does matter. The more it's discoverable, the more it helps everyone. So in that spirit, I'd like to move on to the vendors in the group, because we need to hear from them, because they are in that position where they work with everybody and they see these benefits, perhaps more than the rest of us. So Kari, would you like to go next and offer your perspective? Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Kari Paulson, Vice President of Market Development of Books for ProQuest. Uh, I was saying to, joking with Kara that this is the long and winding road to the podium as well. Um, <laughs> Okay, so I am going to share a uh, perspective on DRM free from, as an aggregator from ProQuest. Um, and I have to say, um, so I have been working with ebooks for more than 15 years, um, about 17 years, 15 years in the academic space. Um, and DRM is not something, obviously, it's reached a higher and higher fever pitch, as we've all understood how. Uh, it impacts our users um, and their ability to do what they need to do with the content. But this has been a conversation that's been going on since day one. Um, it's something that we have been involved with, with libraries and publishers, um, since the beginning of time. Um, and these conversations have evolved. Uh, we're making some progress, um, but not yet enough. So there are a number of ways we've been involved and, and helped to push the boundaries with DRM. Um, uh, along the way, we facilitated a lot of data we've shared with publishers. 
We've worked with libraries to share their perspective, to share data, to help them understand use, to be able to make the best, most informed decisions about how to continue to make their content available. Um, and we've pushed the boundaries with our contracts with publishers. So uh, I think we did a very smart thing along the way where we removed very specific terms about how we would distribute our books with publishers um, and left it a little more open so that we didn't have to continue to go back and renegotiate it. As, as the market, as users, as our understanding of how content can be made available evolved. Um, and we've recognized that DRM is one factor, uh, an important, very important factor and a primary factor in usability, but that there are other, many other aspects that go into making content as usable as possible. So we've continued to invest in improving the user experience in all the ways we could and can. Um, so the goal of DRM free um, is, as we all, I think, would agree, to enhance usability and reduce friction. Uh, for accessing all content. Um, and our goal is to offer as much DRM-free content as we can, wherever its um, publishers will make it available. But it's also where DRM uh, is required or um, required by the publisher to make that as transparent as possible, to make sure that the user understands what they can or can't do with the content so that there is uh, less confusion about um, how they can interact with that content. So the good news is recently uh, we have signed with a number of publishers to deliver DRM-free content. Um, as of, uh, I believe it's September this year, we have um, 115, more than 115,000 DRM-free titles and growing. These are some of the publishers who have agreed to make their content DRM-free on the eBook Central platform. Um, you'll see DeGreuter, and I have to give kudos to um, Ben uh, and to DeGreuter as one of the only larger commercial publishers who have agreed to do so, so far. Um, there's still a lot to do to bring other publishers along. Um, but even before being able to release DRM-free content on the platform, we were investing very heavily in improving the usability. Um, so last year we introduced uh, DRM-free chapter downloads on the platform. And we also, in preparation for adding DRM-free content, um, changed a number of factors on the platform so that we were removing the possibility of confusion with differing uh, rights for how content could be accessed. So we worked very hard to make it as transparent as possible to the user and to make it as intuitive as possible to the user so that as they're interacting with content that may have different DRM restrictions, it's very clear and easy to understand what to expect. Um, and this reduces some of that friction and some of that frustration that users experience when they do encounter DRM. What we saw immediately upon um, introducing those DRM-free chapter downloads was an, an increase in use, a very, a very obvious and instantaneous increase in use and increase in downloads, um, nearly doubling. Um, and this we see as, as a great indicator of um, usability and improved usability for the users, that higher level of interaction with that content. Um, and accessibility, uh, usability is not just about, um, you know, DRM-free or a good user experience, but it's also about making sure that it's accessible and accessible to all users who need to interact with that content. So last year, we also introduced some significant accessibility enhancements to the platform to ensure that users of, um, with, with all types of disabilities or needs are easily able to navigate through our platform and get to the content as needed. So I have to say this is all good news um, and we should feel good about uh, the increased DRM free content. Um, but I am overall disappointed. Um, uh, it's been 15 years that I've been coming to Charleston and talking about ebooks and ebooks usability and DRM, and we're still here, um, and it's not good enough. We still have a way to go. Um, so it was nearly 10 years ago that Springer launched DRM free ebooks on their platform, um, and that was a bold move. Uh, and, and I thought, good, you know, we're going to learn whether or not DRM is actually 
uh, and piracy and usability, if this is actually the burden, you know, the scary thing that we think it is. Um, and we did learn, and it was okay. And Springer continues to make uh, their ebooks DRM free on their own platform, but not through aggregators. Um, and quickly, a number of other publishers follow suit. We have uh, Cambridge and Wiley and TNF and Brill and a number of others who have introduced DRM free content on their own platforms. Um, and I think there was, a, 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 it's fair to say that there's a, a reason for not um, making that DRM free content available everywhere all at once because there was a need to learn. Is this going to be okay? Is the sky going to fall? Um, but now we have a number of years, I think, to show us that the sky hasn't fallen that books continue to be made DRM free on the publisher platforms, um, and that it's delivering better outcomes to users. Um, and now that I think the conversation has moved when you ask publishers, why are you making books DRM free on your own platform but not on the aggregators? Um, I think you know, there's more transparency to say, well, it's a differentiator. Um, and that's okay too, I guess, uh, for a while, but at some point, we need to coalesce around outcomes. Um, we are all in the business of delivering outcomes to all of the stakeholders, whether it be libraries, the publisher, the author, but most, important, the, most importantly, the user. And if we know that it's, um, DRM free is delivering better experience to the users, a better outcome, better learning, better ROIs, um, why would we continue as a, why would publishers continue to want to have subpar experiences of their products out in the market? Um, I would also argue that publishers have other, so many other tools in their tool bag as to how they can differentiate themselves. Um, pricing is a very important one, access models, uh, co-mingling of their content with their other journals and books, um, expert sales uh, team who know the subject matter deeply and as Dean illustrated with his discussion of some of his content. So I call BS on this distinction of DRM free for publishers, but not elsewhere. I think it's time. There was a time and place for that, but I think as an industry and as a market and as a community, it's time to move on and focus on outcomes. If not just because of the mission of delivering, a, an aligned mission to deliver the best outcomes, it also makes good business sense because more use equals better ROI, equals better um, likelihood of books being funded within the library, which ultimately equals more sales. So um, I'm, I'm glad that we're moving ahead and it's really encouraging to see publishers are, are stepping out and learning and doing their due diligence to find out how they can move the needle on DRM, but we're not done, there's more to do. Um, and we're here to continue in that fight alongside um, the publishers and libraries and users alike. Thank you. Thank you, Kari. Kara? That's okay. Um, so, so EBSCO, like ProQuest, is an aggregator of ebooks. We sit in between publishers and libraries and we get a lot of feedback from both of them, a lot of data from both of them, and we try to chart mutually beneficial solutions to move our industry forward. So we distribute about 1.3 million ebooks um, to academic libraries worldwide. As of April this year, 120,000 of those have become DRM free. And we really have four goals with regard to the DRM free initiative that I was gonna kind of share with you. Um, the first is obviously removing barriers to access, making ebooks as efficient and convenient as possible for users within the research workflow, um, et cetera. Um, second is to increase the return on investment for our library partners. We know that usage um, helps them with their collections budgets and it helps them demonstrate their value to their academic community. So, and we know now from data that the access model very much impacts the usage of ebooks. Um, we're seeing with the DRM free model that if they're getting between 20 and 60% more usage than their limited or single user counterparts. Um, so simply increasing the access does increase the usage and makes them more available. Um, it increases the use case, the use cases um, 
that we can apply these ebooks to as well. Um, thirdly, we want to help our publishers, um, our scholarly presses in particular, have a sustainable future. So um, the DRM free model is an unlimited user one. It does cost a little bit more. And we've seen um, a significant uptick in purchases of the unlimited user model since we introduced DRM free. Um, so publishers on our platform that are participating in DRM free have seen a 40% increase in sales overall and a 120% increase in sales of the unlimited user model. Um, publishers that have declined to participate in DRM free um, have seen only about a, they still have seen an increase in unlimited user sales, but uh, only about half of that. Um, so our goal is to continue collect, to, to, excuse me, to collect data from both sides to try to show our community that reducing barriers to access does result in a sort of win-win for both sides. Um, in terms of the other trends that we're seeing um, that, that Kari didn't mention, because um, we do a lot of the same things, obviously, with, with ProQuest, um, we're seeing, as I said, an, an, an expansion of the um, applications of eBooks now that these barriers of DRM-free have been reduced. So we're seeing an increase in um, libraries using library license materials, I'm sorry, institutions using library license materials um, in courses as learning materials throughout the semester, not just for um, ebook, uh, not, not just for academic papers or research, but actually as a part of the learning throughout the um, academic term. We're seeing an increased desire for, for resource sharing, as Ben noted. Um, now that things are DRM free, what else can we do with them? And there's, of course, some challenges there because if it's DRM free, it's not really an interlibrary loan, it's an interlibrary gift. And what does that mean for us? And how can we um, find a way to sort of make that um, also a sustainable path for, for both libraries and publishers? Um, and whenever we see this kind of pushing the boundaries of what our licenses give us the rights to do, um, we see some pricing experimentation with publishers. So as an aggregator, that's part of what we're trying to do as well, is trying to watch what our publishers are doing with pricing, gauge how it's affecting um, the ecosystem, and again, provide both sides with the data that we can help better move ourselves forward and kind of meet um, somewhere in the middle. So that's our, that's our perspective from, from an ebook aggregator. Thank you. Thank you, Kara. We still have problems with the laptop. There's we, no uh, mouse. Right, no mouse, so. Oh. Hold it back. So you heard from the, um, you heard two perspectives similar, I would say, echoing similar sentiments. Um, we've come a long way, but we have long ways to go. And we're seeing results. We're seeing that the RM Free delivers more, more opportunities for everyone involved, especially for um, publishers. But what does all of this mean for, for users? Is it paying off? Are libraries seeing the benefits of all this hard work? Um, uh, I'd like to ask Allison now to give her perspective. Thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm Allison Bradley. I'm the Assistant Director for Collection Strategies at Davidson College. I'll speak for libraries as a whole, just no big thing. Um, and I'll say it's, it, rather than speaking from how do we like these new changes, I want to start from the perspective of why we've been asking for these changes for so long. Why do libraries care whether there's DRM on the ebooks that we provide to our users? Um, although I work in collections now, my background is with public services, reference and instruction. So my individual perspective on DNA, DRM is entirely shaped by things people have yelled at me over the years <laughs> when our collections were failing to meet their expectations. Um, much of the research work that I've done in this area was as part of the Charlotte Initiative, a research and advocacy project that was based at UNC Charlotte and funded by the Mellon Foundation. It proposed three simple principles for how ebooks and academic libraries could continue to work the way that books had worked for centuries. 
um, to support the research and teaching and learning for our campuses now, as well as collecting and preserving scholarship for future use. We proposed three very simple principles that we thought were necessary to continue with that function, um, that we should have the option to buy ebooks that provided access to unlimited simultaneous users, the option of perpetual access rights, and the option of no digital rights management on the titles. Um, the principles came from our experience with early ebook packages like NetLibrary, which we had through a statewide consortium, and it led to a lot of confusion and frustration for our users. Most of the complaints that we received about the early ebook packages that we tried were about the access issues that our faculty faced. Um, they couldn't do what they wanted to as teachers. They couldn't ask the class to read a chapter for tomorrow if there was a single seat and the first student who got it had the book for everybody. But they also couldn't use the books the way they wanted to as researchers. Lots of the discussions in those early years framed the issues with ebooks as well. An entire class couldn't use the print book at once, so we're trying to model what you have to do with a single print volume. But for researchers, we're able to control the way our print collections are used with a lot more granularity than an ebook package provides. Our faculty were allowed to check out books for a year at a time so they could do close reading. They could unpack an argument. And they could really work with that content. Um, so we found that our limitations with those early ebook packages led to frustration in all of the kinds of ways that our collections were designed to support the work of our college. Most of all, I found with individual faculty members that they did not expect ebooks to work like print books, they expected ebooks to work like e journals. At that stage, they had a good 10 to 15 years of experience with the journal content that we were providing them, and they wanted a book to work the way that an article did. And they weren't interested in any arguments to the contrary. They're very rarely interested in any of our arguments for why we do anything. <laughs> um, so they really expected to have downloadable content portable formats, and simultaneous access for as many users as needed. That was my experience working at a large research institution with over 28,000 students, lots and lots of faculty, lots of fields to support. Um, when I left UNC Charlotte two and a half years ago for Davidson College, I was really curious to see if those issues translated to a very different type of institution. Davidson is a small liberal arts college. It's, it has the most students it ever had with just over 1,900 right now. And I, I really did not know how those expectations would play out, whether my users would care the same way about the issues that we had seen in the past. Um, so I think I made it to my second day without a faculty member in my office yelling <laughs> about why the ebook that he had written and wanted his class to read wasn't there when it had been there two weeks before. So it, it was very easy for me to see that a smaller population means that you have fewer instances of turnaways. It's easier to get the word out when platforms work different ways, when books on platforms work different ways, when the experience is going to be inconsistent, you have a little bit better shot at teaching people how and why those challenges are going to arise. But the underlying issues are still there. Um, our faculty and our students are not in any way interested in learning why these platforms work differently. They are really not interested in learning why one book on a single platform lets them download the entire thing with a click, and another book lets them download 10 pages, and another one doesn't even let them copy and paste text into their notes. Um, what they want is for these library ebooks to perform like a single part of the library collection, and they want an experience that's very simple, very streamlined, and very intuitive. Thank you. Angela? <laughs> <laughs>